What is up, most distinguished and esteemed fellow welders? This is going to be part two where we look at stacking dimes with MIG and why it's detrimental, why you might want to do it, and mostly why you probably don't want to do it. So I've done a ton of tests here. We're going to do more tests in the video. So with that said, let's get right into it. So right away, I want to address some of the criticisms that the previous video got. And hey, we're all entitled to our opinions, and most of them were actually very valid points, and that's all going to get addressed in this video. But the most common criticism that I had was, well, the metal was too thick. And that, I would say, is valid because I was welding 3.8 steel. However, I know for a fact that the same is going to hold true on quarter inch and likely 3.16 as well. And anything basically 3.16 and above, there's going to be issues with penetration and strength. And 3.8 plates in particular, the reason I chose that was for, well, one, uh, the results are going to be, the disparity between them is going to be significantly more. And not only that, but in the off-road industry where you see a ton of stuff welded with stacks of dimes, it's very common for quarter and three-eighths plate to be used. I mean, universally, that's what people weld on. Not to mention, I don't know if you guys ever browse the Facebook groups or the forums or anything, but 99% of the time, anytime you see someone stacking dimes, it's always on quarter inch or three-eighths plates. And there's a reason for that. And that is because the heat sink effect of the thick steel makes it far easier to stack dimes. Go and try that on 1 16th thick steel with MIG, and guess what? You're not going to be able to stack dimes on it because the heat input by doing your circles or your oscillations, whatever have you, you're going to blow holes by putting too much heat into it. So in effect, the stacking dimes is primarily on 3 16ths and up steel, not less than that, at least all of the, the welds you're going to see on the Instagram and, and the forums. So I picked that more or less because that's what other people do. In no way, shape, or form would I ever try and run colder settings on thick plate, but that's what a lot of people do. So again, I was reflecting what the world does, not what I do or what I would do. So that's why in this video, we're going to test on quarter inch as well. And my guess is we're going to have the same results as three eighths with no difference. And that's just based on knowledge of testing stuff on this channel, channel in the past and my own experience. So I already crossed that out. Uh, bevel, that was another uh, controversial thing. And that is, well, you didn't bevel the plates. Well, this video isn't to talk about beveling. I have a whole nother video that I shot that I'll be coming out with talking about beveling and why that's not a cure-all either. And I'll give you a little tip on that or a thought. Okay, when you're welding quarter inch, like this is quarter inch and three-eighths plate, it's often common to thought, oh, well, you just put a bevel on it and that solves everything. But what you don't understand is a bevel doesn't give you the capability to weld thicker material than your welder's capable of. So if you have like a 140 amp MIG welder, you know, slapping a, a half plate thickness bevel on it is not going to give you better root fusion. All it's going to do is make the depth of the weld thicker. The same effect could be happen, I guess, if you had like a straight 90, so something like this. And then you just ran two, three passes on it to fill it out. You're making a thicker weld. You're not fusing the root together better. And I'll put pictures up to explain what I mean. Now, there is a caveat to that. Because like everything in welding, <laughs> you can never say never. It is common to short arc MIG weld. Because that's what we're dealing with. And that's what Motorsports uses. To short arc MIG on thicker plates. Say even half inch plates or bigger. What you're going to find is when guys are doing that to a specific code, they're often doing a big wide open bevel, a knife edge, or a very small landing, and they're running a gap. When you run that circumstance, you can run uh, basically lower settings in a short arc process and get fusion, and it's not an issue. There's a serious problem with that, though. That only applies primarily to doing butt welds, that are beveled in open root. I've done a lot of welding, 
and outside of structural or and i don't weld pipe but uh people who weld pipe if you're fabricating something for an off-road vehicle or a race car how often are you ever going to do an open root beveled butt joint maybe on a frame if you're going to z it out to get clearance or shorten it you could do that but like say you're making control arms or welding a truss on an axle you're not doing that so that's not really reflective of the real world not to mention all those motorsports parts they're not butt welded anywhere virtually on them they're all fillet welds and lap welds okay so again i don't see that the beveling is an issue and there's also another very serious issue with that say you took a fillet weld like this on quarter inch plate right and you beveled that top plate if you think you're going to get more fusion, you will to a certain extent. The issue is, okay, your top plate's beveled. Your bottom plate is still th the full thickness. So, like, if you take this, for example, this is 3 8 plate. You're only beveling one of the members. If you were to bevel this, the, the plate you're welding it to, the flat plate, down to where that's also, say, an eighth inch thick and then weld it out, you would be able to achieve root fusion on that. But who does that? Nobody. Which is why, you know, beveling it is not necessarily a solution and nobody runs open root bevel on a motorsports part on thicker plate, quarter inch, three eighths, whatever. So again, the beveling isn't really going to be that effective in this case and when i go into the video that gets released in the future where i do bevel a bunch of stuff you're going to find out in a hurry that's not a cure-all so i think i covered that pretty good another kind of common thought and this is more or less uh, on the forums that i i browse fairly frequently and comment on people when they say well i've done it for years and the controversy and this is probably one of the worse mindsets to get into now i knew this video was going to be controversial and a few people even got mad at me and said some pretty nasty things and i had a good chuckle about it because at the end of the day th th that person's the one that's not going to learn anything and i'm not saying i'm always right and there's always going to be flaws in anything when the harder you look the more flaws you can find right but having the mindset of well i've done it that way for years th that's just how it's done i don't see a problem you're the guy that's going to make a serious mistake and you're the guy that's not going to learn and you're the guy that's going to do things wrong in welding there is so many there's so many variables that you cannot take the approach that because that's the way i do it it's right i find it and i'm not making fun of any pipeliners pipe welders out there but some of the old school pipe welders out there they're excellent at welding pipe but when they take what they do on pipe and try and apply it to structural steel everything about the thought process they have if they have the attitude well how i do it is right how you do it on pipe is right you're going to make some serious mistakes like i've argued with pipeliners that run 7018 downhill that you don't do that and they say well i've done it forever well that's cool because 7018 for manufacturers aren't specified to run vertical down nor uh, and that's across all the manufacturers nor is it really a good idea and nor is it permitted in structural steel but yet again pipe welders might do it and somehow it might be approved it's not again i don't think it's smart but what i'm saying is just because you do a thing something a certain way doesn't mean that that's the gold standard and what i would tell any of you if you feel so strongly in the way you do things as being right such as if you do stack dimes cut and etch what you're doing look at it if you don't have root fusion what you're and and you're running cold settings what you're doing is wrong and i'm going to make that statement because you're sacrificing the strength of something to make it look a certain way and that's not good so again you've done it for years that's great be open-minded test your own crap and get an opinion of where you're at and what i found is these guys that done it for years guys probably have never tested a single weld that they've ever done so if they did they'd probably realize what they're doing now in that not to drag this all longer but the another argument is well i never had a weld fail well that's somewhat valid in the sense that okay cool you made a strong enough weld to meet the job but 
I've already proven in a previous video that you can lose 40 to 50% strength simply by lowering your settings in an attempt to make pretty welds. Is that something that you want to do? If that's acceptable to you, then okay. To me, I rather get the 50% stronger welds because, well, for one, I weld on higher liability stuff than a lot of people, like tow trucks, okay? And I won't even mention some of the repairs I've had to do because of the liability with it. But I will not sacrifice the quality of something I do, the strength of something I do to make it visually look good. If, I, if the visual appeal is all that matters, I'll TIG weld it. Why on earth am I going to try and MIG like TIG and lose strength? I don't get it, but that's me. Now, the last one, and I, I kind of really laughed about that, is someone had posted something about that they lost respect for me because of the video, and hey, you know, everyone's entitled to their own opinion, you know, and I, I would say a joke about that, but I'd probably get blocked on YouTube, so I'll avoid that. But we all have our own opinions. I can only test things, provide data, and show why I think a certain way. If you think differently, if you think that my tests aren't valid, you do what you do normally, but you go and test what you've done. There's certain things in welding that are just universals. And one of them is to fuse a root, you need X amount of time and you need X amount of heat in that, in that junction to get root fusion. Anytime on face value that guys come out and say that, well, you know, it's this magic settings that you got to change or the, there's cold lap like on the stack of dimes here. Well, well, no shit there's cold lap because in order to get that look, you have to run cold. I mean, sure, you can bump that settings up 5% to just per perfectly dial into where visually your MIG weld has no evidence of any flaws like cold lap or lack of fusion at the toes, any of that, right? But that does not change what's in the root. All you're doing is fusing the very surface of it, and the root is going to be trash. And that's me talking from years of experience and in my testing. I don't know how anyone can achieve root fusion or anything resembling it while running so cold that they get the stack of dimes look on the surface. The exception to that is if you're running spray arc with pulse where you're running stupid high settings and pulsing high to low, you could create a ripple pattern without a doubt with that, but it's not going to look like a stack of dimes that everyone posts up that everyone does on motorsports parts. It doesn't look like that. It's a flatter ripple. You don't have that high peak and valley. So anyways, with all of that said, let's actually look at some of this stuff talk about it and learn. All right, so we have a plate in front of us and I thought it was important to do this to demonstrate the difference in penetration profiles that you create when you run different settings. And we start off, it's the coldest over here up to the hottest here. Now I did four separate test groups plus I did one 60-10 weld and that I'll cover a little bit later, but let's talk about the test groups. Each group which is a group of three, I did three things in all of them. So the first one, all I did is ran a bead while kind of stitching a little bit. The second one, I did kind of a small circle, which that's what you typically will do to create a stack of dimes look. And then the third one, I ran uh, even wider circles. Now you'll have to, I'll have to apologize, some of the crap from the nozzle fell in here, but that's not really an issue because the penetration profile is going to be very uh, accurate inside. So anyways, this might not look like a stack of dimes, but that is exactly these cold settings are what I use to create this weld. And let me zoom in. So when you look at this weld, it looks exactly like a stack of dimes, much more so than this. And that has to do with the fact that when you weld on a flat plate, the molten metal just kind of wants to run all around without having a joint to put it in or surface tension, etc. Uh, the effects are less pronounced, I guess. But you can see basically a stack of dimes. Now these settings, when you look at it on the plate, they look colder than hell for quarter inch plate. It's roped up like caulk. Only when I 
kind of looped it around a little bit to get a little bit slower travel speed did it kind of look more appropriate but it's still the wrong settings for quarter inch plate yet the results on an actual fillet weld and i did both quarter inch and three eighths with these settings is subpar now when we go down this and look at the other ones this group of settings is hotter yet still when you oscillate there's some uh of that captured in here it's not a perfect looking weld and then again doing small little circles there's far more of a ripple pattern but you can see even jumping up to the next settings how the ripple pattern is starting to disappear slightly it's more pronounced here and again i don't know how good that looks on the video it's probably a little bit hard to tell and then the real wide ones okay it's still it's not as defined as this and again, as we keep going up in settings, what you're going to see, and then over here, the weld, as you get to appropriate settings, which these are appropriate settings for 3 8 and maybe a little bit hot for quarter, when you run straight in, you do not, or uh, oscillation, you do not get ripples, much like you're running straight in. And the reason for that is the molten puddle is far too liquid to capture any of that. When you look at the comparison between these three and these three, you notice how, okay, I'm circling here and then it's captured. You notice there's no real ripple pattern to this. Same thing here. That's because when you run appropriate settings that create root fusion or anything resembling fusion close to the root, the weld pool is too liquid to capture your hand movements. Not to mention, when you run cold settings like this, it will not penetrate as well regardless of whether you're oscillating, you're weaving, you're circle eing, you lose penetration. And when we look at the cut and etch on this, it will prove it. Now, this weld here, which was done with this Red Rod 6010, I did this to prove to you guys that you cannot compare a short arc MIG to 6010. So many people see guys on a pipeline and people on Instagram posting stacks of dime with stick with 6010, and then they think, oh, okay, well, you can do it with that. You can do it with MIG. 6010 run at appropriate amperages can stack dimes all day. It is a fast freezing weld pool. Short arc MIG is anything but a fast freezing weld pool. It's so liquid that you can't run vertical up with any even remotely appropriate settings with MIG without weaving to use the surface tension of sticking the metal to the cold plate on the sides. You literally can't run vertical up because a weld pool in, in a stringer, the weld pool will basically sink back and start dripping off. 6010 can run vertical up and overhead without dripping any metal out because of how fast it freezes. That is one of the great benefits of it. But unfortunately, for the sake of short arc MIG, 6010 has excellent penetration while stacking dimes. Short arc MIG does not. It's not even close. And that is the reality. There's no way to get around that. And running reduced settings to make it look like a 6010 or a TIG weld, you're losing performance. You can't have root fusion and really good fusion overall in a weld without heat and without time. And stacking dimes does not increase the heat in a root and it does not increase the time that's spent there at an elevated temperature. So if you want more root fusion with MIG, you step up to what's known as spray arc where you're running very high wire feed, thus very high amperage and very high voltage and specific gases for that that increase basically the voltage in the arc. Because you no longer are short arc welding, you are literally spraying molten metal in the presence of an arc. That has huge root fusion, huge penetration. Short arc MIG is not that process and it is not something that you should probably be stacking dimes with if you're running reduced settings. Now, with that said, let's look at the cut and etch of this and talk about what's there. So when you look here, there's virtually no penetration as would be expected by these cold settings. These settings are exactly what you need to run dimes on plates and you'll see that later when I pretty much make a Instagram worthy stack of dimes on a fillet weld. But very little penetration. You can see as you do circle movements, it makes a wider weld, but it doesn't really 
increase the depth of penetration, and you're going to see that across the board. The penetration of short arc MIG isn't going to hit a deeper depth by weaving or oscillating or any of that. It's limited by what amount of metal that the wire can go through and your amperage that you're running, aka your wire feed. So this is unacceptable for quarter inch any day of the week and weaving with it as you can see on a flat plate doesn't do a whole lot more to improve it and you're going to start seeing some even more interesting results as we go through. Keep in mind that what you're seeing here is one place on the weld. The weld when you do weaves and circles is going to be very inconsistent in actual penetration. Like you could make 40 different cuts on this and every one of them is going to be less or maybe a little bit more than what you see when you or talking the weaves. Doing a stitch motion or going straight in is going to be pretty consistent what you see number one is, but there will still be variations over just running a straight stringer with no movement. So here are slightly elevated settings, still nowhere near what we should be running on quarter inch plate. The first weld has, I would say, the best penetration profile. The other two not that good and the problem is with the circles is that i could cut the plate in multiple places and have a different cut and etch and that's because it's going to be inconsistent and when we actually do some fillet weld break tests later you're going to see uh what i mean by that but yeah this still isn't very good these are settings that you could stack dimes with but any more than this with the wire that I was running, you're not going to be able to get a dime stack because the weld is simply going to stay too hot. And there really isn't any way around that. But again, subpar, not looking too good. Let's go on to some hotter settings. So these settings, they look like they have less penetration than the previous ones. The angle of the picture is just a little bit off. They basically have the same penetration as the previous ones, despite having higher settings. And again, not really the best looking at this. And you're starting to see when you weave wider than the previous ones, how you get that weird like double peak for the penetration profile. And this is why it's dangerous on fillet welds to do a wide weave, like a big, big circle, because the root, which would be in the center of that puddle right there where you have less penetration, that's going to be the root. And that's why big circles on thick plate, you're going to have no root fusion and just hit the side plate. So you want to avoid that. And again, the profile of this is really not ideal. All of these were done with a push angle, by the way, which does limit penetration compared to pulling. And that's something I touch later in the video. All right, let's go on with some hotter settings. So here we have what the machine considers appropriate for this thickness of plate. And we have a lot of kind of interesting stuff going on here. So first off, the penetration on number 10 is pretty much the same as the previous ones. It's not better or worse. Again, it's kind of an angles a little bit off. But the penetration isn't that good. Part of it's because of the push angle instead of pulling. And another part of it is the stitch movement that I was doing more or less to try and create a stack of metal even though it really doesn't look that good in the picture when you do that you're creating inconsistent penetration now when you look at number 11 that is what you're seeing there is that at that moment in the cut and etch there's basically no penetration at all so it's likely when i circled back over the previous weld pool that that happened. If I did another cut and etch an inch away from this, it would probably look like number 12 or maybe even more penetration. And you're never going to be able to get away from that. When you do those ripples rather than straight in, your profile is going to be inconsistent as hell. And then when you look at number 13, which is a 6010 rod, and you can see how much more penetration that has despite stacking dimes, and you can start understanding why. You can stack dimes with 6010, but you can't arguably with MIG without sacrificing some penetration. Now let's look at all the pictures combined and talk about it. So when you look at all four of them by each other, you can see some, uh, I guess, consistencies here. 
all of the stringers with a stitch have a fairly similar penetration profile. And then when you look at all of the weaves, every one of them is a little bit different. And as you increase in wire feed, aka amperage, doesn't guarantee you more penetration. And it all depends on where you cut and etch it as to what is going on. And that's one of the reasons why I tell people, generally speaking, for a root pass to avoid any kind of variables that's outside of your control. A single weld is far easier to keep consistent than it is doing a weave, and this kind of shows that. Now, none of these are really ideal for penetration or for the performance, and a lot of that, like I said earlier, is that all of these would have benefited from a pull angle rather than a push. And oscillating and doing circle ease and stitches, generally speaking, like I said, create inconsistencies. All right, let's move on. So the weld on the right is depicted in a picture above. It's a very hot, kind of wide weave, but you don't see any ripples because the molten pool was far too hot to see that. The weld on the left is 6010, and you can see a clear, distinct stack of dimes there. And you look at the penetration of the two, and you can see why, again, that you can do that with 6010 stick rod, and that it's not a good idea to attempt with MIG. The penetration, there's no question with 6010 that it will fuse things together. It's a completely different process, uh, with different variables in short arc MIG. If anything, spray arc MIG has more in common with 6010. So with all of that, you can see that there's significant differences when you run colder settings and actual penetration profiles. And that's generally something that's undesirable because if you're welding 3 16 quarter, 3 8 whatever, you want some fusion or your welds are going to be exceptionally weak. So we saw that running settings that can make you stack dimes and put it on Instagram like you're an awesome welder aren't necessarily the best for penetration because like I said, these cold settings are what I welded this with and it looks exactly like what you find on Instagram and your off-road parts and your motorsports parts. And to address the controversy on this, uh, a lot of people have suggested, oh, well, you're just running the wrong settings. Well, to me, my response to that is, okay, if you feel after the end of this video and you watch the first video that the settings I am running are inappropriate and that I could still stack dimes with your magical settings, absolutely leave your settings in the comments. And I guess in part three, I will run all of the settings and the techniques that you suggest to create a stack of dimes while maintaining fusion. And we will cut and etch it and find out. You know, I'm not opposed to doing that because I think we can all learn something. So on that note, I want to talk about some flaws or some technique errors that you can introduce flaws into your welding with short arc MIG in specific. And one of them, and this is a very common one, is that guys, regardless of if you're pushing or pulling, you'll do what's called riding the puddle. When you run appropriate settings, your travel speed with short arc MIG is actually fairly fast, okay? You're moving at a decent clip, and you want that wire to be hitting the leading edge of the puddle where it's the thinnest. If you ride the puddle where, say, your settings are so low and you're producing, you know, if you go the proper speed, the weld you produce is so thin and so small, it's just not any, you know, it's, you don't want to do like two, three passes. You want to do one and just make it a big fat pass. When you ride that puddle and even oscillate, what ends up happening is that wire hits the top of the molten puddle, shorts out, and then repeats that, you know, a thousand times a minute, oh, more than that. And that wire is never hitting the root. you got to remember that the short arc MIG process has no penetration through a thick weld puddle. And when you sit and slowly drag that puddle in, letting it fill, you're losing root fusion doing that. There's no way around it by riding the puddle. It, it just it does not input enough heat. All the heat's going to the surface. It's not like the wire penetrates through the whole molten puddle all the way to the root and fuses that. And that's why you would typically see better root fusion by moving a little bit faster with hot heat settings and a smaller weld than you will with a bigger weld.
okay? Like it's say the same settings, but you take a lot more time. And then also regarding that, when you start doing like circle E's and oscillations on a root weld, what ends up happening is you might bite more into the sides of it, but the root is gonna be too cold to get any decent fusion, especially on quarter inch and above plates. So in general, you wanna avoid doing that as a root pass. And I know people all the time tell me, well, I've done circle E's and all of that forever on quarter inch and three eighths plate, and that's, that's great. And it doesn't mean that your weld is gonna automatically fail, but by the lack of root fusion you're gonna cause by doing that, it will be a weaker weld. You know, the, the, how it, the parts design will determine whether or not it breaks in a stress it sees. But I'm just trying to tell you this so that if you, if what you, it, I'll put it to you this way. If what you're welding, you want to be strong, you can't do things that reduce root fusion, period. So that means circle ease, all of that. It's going to limit penetration with the short arc MIG process. Okay. All right. With that said, let's look at a couple other plates. So I have two sets of plates. We are going to weld two fillet welds. We're going to run one at the settings that my machine says for this uh, quarter inch plate, and we're going to run one at settings that allows you to be capable of running dimes. And the reason I say allows you is because if you run settings that any machine or any welding calculator suggests for quarter inch material, you will never be able to stack dimes with it because the weld pool is going to be simply too hot and too liquid to get any kind of ripple pattern. And that's why we have to drop settings in order to create that look. So we'll start out with the hot settings and then we will do the colder dime stack settings. All right, so I ran a bunch more tests than I originally planned, but that's all right because we'll get more data and data is good. So the two on the right were run at the recommended settings for my machine, and those settings are very close to what uh, Miller's weld calculator recommends. So just straight in, it produced a weld that is smaller in physical height than these. It's roughly, I would say, appropriate in size for quarter inch. All of these welds, in order to stack dimes, you had to make a wider weld. So these are arguably a bit oversized for quarter inch. So a little bit smaller, a little bit bigger, but again, straight in, no movement, just normal settings. These two I did with a push movement. And the first one I did, I have a little bit of cold lap here up in the toe. And honestly, you're going to have that with settings this low. It's very, very difficult because you can't see what's going on here because the MIG, the arc and the uh, MIG nozzle obstructs your view. All it takes is a millisecond, too little of hold time, and you get cold lap and a cold toe up here. So the first shot, not the best. Second one, pretty much got it all uh, eliminated. It might not look like that on the video because all this dust and stuff, but that pretty much took care of it. And I would say acceptable in appearance, but probably not acceptable in performance. Now these two, 
I decided to do a pulling movement, which I thought that everyone that stacked dimes with MIG does push. Well, I guess I'm wrong because when you look at these, not only is it a more distinct dime stack than the push, it's far cleaner and the toe line is almost perfect. So I have a feeling that all these guys that are doing these motorsports parts are likely pulling and not pushing. Uh, simply because the bead appearance looks better and it's far easier to do this than pushing because you can actually see what's going on. And that was unexpected and that's why I, I actually did another one of these off camera just so that we had enough of a, a test uh, to really compare these. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to weld two of, or th one from each, so three total, and we're going to break them to the face look at the penetration, and then we're going to do a cut and etch of the other one and look at the penetration and compare all of that and really see what we're dealing with. All right, guys, so the moment of truth. I have the MIG like TIG that was run with a pull angle or a drag angle, push angle, and then straight in with proper settings. Now, this test we're mainly going to be looking at the internal penetration, which should be significantly different among these. And the fact that I'm load testing this, a lot of people kind of were critical of it and saying, well, nobody tests that. And I understand that this isn't like a normal where you put it in a shop press like I've done and then bent it. And it's a little bit different. But the whole point of this is that, no, this isn't a scientific test rig. However, we can get pretty good data uh, through this test because a lower number in this test should result in less penetration because the more that the root is fused, the harder it is to break this. And since all of these are the exact same height, same thickness of material and from the same batch of material, the results will be pretty accurate. Now, in simple terms, if I break one of these and it breaks at a lot lower than another one, then we should see the evidence of less penetration, which is held up pretty remarkably accurate uh, for all the tests I've done like this. All right, so this is the MIG like TIG with the pull angle. Let's see what this breaks at. Hundred and one. Let's do this one, which is the push angle. 81, which is somewhat uh, predictable, I would say. Generally, you get more penetration pulling than you do pushing. However, on a single, like a stringer weld, where you're not weaving or doing circles, your weld is going to be more crowned up. And now the arguably proper settings. About 115. So the pull angle definitely with the circles, stack and dimes performed pretty good, uh, surprisingly. However, the push angle, uh, not so much. And I have a feeling, and that's something I probably should have tested, is doing a pull angle with uh, the proper settings that the machine recommended because we would get more penetration, thus an even higher result. All right, guys, I thought I was selling this video a little bit short by not doing a pull MIG weld. So I ended up doing two more coupons, one uh, for the purpose of cut and etch, and this one where we're gonna break it to the face and look at the internal penetration of it. Now, as you saw in the circle movement, it had a tremendous effect on penetration on pull versus push. I have a feeling that this should post higher numbers and strength as well, simply because pulling generally increases root fusion because the puddle gets pushed away and it's easier to stay on that leading edge of that puddle because you're not welding through the puddle per se. That's very easy to do and ride the puddle like when you're doing a push angle. So that's what I got here. Same settings as the push. So I didn't change anything. I literally just ran two more passes on prep plates. And now we're going to break this one. 
So the previous one was somewhere around 115. We'll see what this guy's at. Hundred and twenty six and it ended up bending the plate uh, quite a bit or actually hundred and twenty seven But it ended up bending the plate a lot more than the previous ones because guess what that root is probably attached a little bit better in there Well, let's break this and look at it on the table So I broke all of these the results were a little bit different so right off the bat the push angle with stack and dimes performed a lot poorer than the other ones okay the pull angle performed really good not quite as good as a straight in single pass now the interesting thing is when you look at how flat these plates are i mean this one's a little bit bent and then you compare it to like this very little and that almost no force to break it and that comes down to the lack of root fusion on this guy uh, really contributed towards how easy it was to break and we'll look at the up close so why don't we start with the worst one first so let's look at this guy right here this is the colder settings and the push angle you can see that there's virtually no fusion in the upright plate only maybe half to a third of that weld was fused in the rest of it almost the original plate is still present there the polished plate when you look at <laughs> the edge here there's no breakdown of any of that edge at all this is going to be what would be deemed unacceptable now visually it was still appear uh well like decent appearing but that's not you know a weld needs to be strong before it needs to be pretty. Now, that's not an excuse for if you make inconsistent, ugly welds and they hold that you're doing something right. But I think you know what I mean. When you look at the back side of this, you can really see how it's kind of like a bead of caulk on plate. Very little fusion into the bottom plate as well. The heat input was actually not bad. You can tell by how the heat affected zone lines came out this far. So we put heat in it. Over time, the problem was is we just didn't fuse that root because we didn't spend enough time with enough heat to do that. And thus, the performance was very, very subpar. So, all right, let's look at the next one. So here we have the MIG-like TIG where I ran in a pole angle, and the appearance of it is much, much better. Not only that... But the weld broke straight through the middle, which is kind of what you want to see versus when you look at this, it definitely favored one side more than the other. So that is better. However, when we look in here, the whole original plate edge, and this is only quarter inch steel, guys, it's completely untouched. So we have no root fusion or penetration beyond the root. So that's kind of not good. It did hold up to a lot of strength in this test. However, part of what helped that is the physical weld size was bigger than the just straight in weld. So not only did this perform, well, I, I don't know, five, 10 numbers lower, but it's a lot bigger of a weld. And that fusion in there is nowhere near ideal. When you look at the back side of this as well, and it might be a little hard for you to see, but it kind of has like the sawtooth pattern where the weld is stuck and then there's missing weld where it broke off from there. And you definitely see that sawtooth pattern right here. Well, everywhere you see this black crap, it basically just peeled the surface, even though it was clean, off of this plate and there was no fusion. And what the interesting thing is, see how it does that? The reason you're seeing that is because that exists at every time that I lapped up over the previous weld, I lost fusion at that point because I'm now attempting to have that wire in the short arc mode go through that whole thick molten puddle. Because remember guys, it's in a fillet weld. Your molten puddle is as big as this. Well, when you step forward and then circle back, that wire is only penetrating on the leading edge. When you come back and fill, 
you are losing root fusion at that point. And what ends up happening is this. You have very inconsistent fusion near the root, even though we don't have root fusion, it's very inconsistent, again, undesirable. So now this guy didn't have a clean break either. And that's something that when you do circles at the start, it can actually help fuse a little bit better. And also your run-in speed and MIG welder settings can affect uh, this type of performance from the start of the weld. Because remember, this was pushed. And because the travel speed was simply faster, you're not going to get as much fusion at the start as you are for most of the weld. Uh, again, you don't see that too much on these because of the time that was spent circling at the start. Now, when we look at the results of this, it's not hugely better. About half of the weld has fusion in the root nothing past it really so again short arc mig on quarter inch isn't really the most high uh penetration process to say the least so only about half of it has fusion and then the beginning you can see you can just tell that it was cold here so i need to adjust run in speed or maybe bump my settings up a little bit more from where i'm at to try and get the best performance and again, it pays to, to cut and etch your welds without a doubt. Now, had I ran spray arc on this, that would have likely eliminated all of this. Or if I had used a runoff tab, that would have also eliminated that. But again, at least I would say half of it, it broke down the edge somewhat. Half of it, it's very similar to this. But when you compare the two of them, the reason that this broke at slightly higher settings despite having a smaller weld is really because at least half the plate kind of had some fusion and that's where that little bit of strength came from. All right, let's move on to the next thing. This is the push. As you can see, kind of only fusion, I'd say starting at about the halfway point over in the root, the rest of it, it really, I wouldn't call it a great weld by any means, but this is typical of short arc MIG. It really has a hard time biting in the root, especially when you push it. Well, when you compare that to the same settings just ran on a pole angle, look at that. This whole edge here is all broken down. So we have complete root fusion. We don't really have much penetration, but this is all fused. We have a little bit cold of a start. So my machine has things like run-in speed and inductance. All of those things could possibly be adjusted to get better performance, uh, especially on starts. But, you know, this is going to be typical on a MIG weld. Your start's going to be the coldest part of the weld, and that's welding in general. Stick is the same way. But you compare and contrast that, like that's significant better performance. The weld broke right in the middle versus like you look at this guy where it kind of broke a little bit offset. And again, that's really due to a lack of consistent fusion. I would say that that's far better than I would have thought. So just simply by pulling versus pushing, I got to say in the future, I'm going to focus more on pulling with a uh, thicker plate with MIG and or use spray arc. But yeah, pretty interesting there. I didn't expect that. So much like the stack and dimes, there's an increase in strength and performance when going to pull over push. All right, well, let's go to the cut and etch. So we're going to go through these one by one. Let's start with the push stack and dimes. So when you look at this pushed dimes here, we can see a lack of fusion at the root. It's not as bad as I would have anticipated, but keep in mind if I did a bunch more cuts, some of them would be probably worse than this. Maybe one or two of the cuts would be fused better. The weaving and circles generally gets decent side fusion, but you're never going to get good root fusion simply because of the amount of molten metal you have to weld through in order to get that. And that's why I generally tell people to avoid doing circles as a root pass because you're going to get good sidewall fusion, but nothing in the root. Also, this is one of many tests that I've done on this exact same thing. And all of them had this much fusion on a root or less. Some of them even had poor fusion into the upright plate, depending on the angle that the weld was put down. So again, 
very undesirable results. And I know you're probably saying to yourself, well, who cares about that little bit of root fusion? Well, the reality is, is that you're giving up somewhere between 20 to 40% strength on any kind of bend towards the face of the root by not having that little bit, like you're talking a 16th of an inch fused, and it has to do with leverage. All right, let's look at the pull dimes. So this is a pull dimes. I put the weld down at a little bit too low of an angle so it didn't hit the upright plate as much. The upright plate is fused. I know you can't see it. I apologize for the bad image quality. But the bottom plate, you can see that line to the left of the dot where that root is. That's a complete lack of fusion. That weld isn't melted into that plate at all. You don't want to see that. That's, that particular area is going to be pretty weak. Now, this weld, had I cut it maybe an inch away from here or even a quarter inch, it probably wouldn't have that lack of fusion. So, again, doing the whole circles is going to create a very random fusion because every time you overlap on it, it's going to cause essentially cold lap. Had I hit the upright plate better so it was more at a 45 degree angle, I think it would have looked identical to the previous weld where you just have a lack of fusion at the root and no line there. But again, the fewer variables you can put into your weld, the better. So here's a push stringer. As you can see, it doesn't have a great penetration profile. It did hit the 45 degree angle, which is good. And it's just below the surface of the plate. It might look like it's riding on the surface, but it's just ground a little weird there. But there is some fusion to the bottom plate. It's just not great. Now, there's no open dot at the root. But the root fusion, basically the weld hit right to that inside corner, and then that was it. Nothing more. Now, pushing, like I said earlier, generally limits penetration. If you pull on thicker plate, you'll generally get better penetration. So again, this isn't ideal. It's not the best. It's not really that much better than the previous welds. But the difference is this whole weld, likely through the whole length of it, is going to be very consistent to that. And that's why it's stronger. It's not so much from the root fusion being, you know, microscopically better. It's just start to finish. It's more consistent than stacking dimes. And that's where the extra strength comes from. Let's look at a pull stringer now. So this was done with the same settings as a previous weld and just pulled instead of pushed. And look at that. That's significantly better than any of the three previous ones. We have 100% solid root fusion. We actually have some penetration. The sidewall profile overall looks really good. And this is exactly what you would want to see during a cut and etch. And you're simply not going to achieve this when you do circle E's and dimes and all of that on a root pass because it just doesn't penetrate. And remember, Doing it as a stringer straight in is going to produce a consistent weld start to finish because you don't have any of variables of doing circles and stacking dimes and all of that, which is why when we did the brake test that it broke at the highest rating out of any of them, and then the actual uh, inspection of the root had the most consistent fusion and the most fusion start to finish. All of these variables help you make stronger welds. So again, I think it's pretty conclusive looking at this stuff that no root fusion and poor penetration equals weaker welds. So it's really up to you to determine if the loss in strength for a visual appeal is acceptable because that's exactly what you're going to get. And for the fun of it, let's look at a 6010 weld for a cut and etch. And this weld, even though I don't have a picture of it, it's from an older video, had a perfect stack of dimes on it. And let's see what that internal weld looks like. So here we have a 6010 pass. There's a little bit of undercut on the top toe, pretty typical if you don't watch your arc length. But you look at that penetration, 100% penetration into basically the top and bottom plate, plenty of root fusion, and then penetration beyond that root. And this is typical of 6010 with a weld that looks like a perfect stack of dimes. MIG is not capable of doing this. TIG, you can also get a perfect stack of dimes with a fusion very similar to this. So again, TIG, MIG, stick, they're all completely different, have completely different capabilities. And you don't want to just make something look like another process without understanding what you're losing. 
All right, let's go and move on. Well, pretty interesting results, weren't they? Uh, not what I expected. If anything, I was most surprised that the pulling would have that different of an effect for the welding. And that plate earlier that I welded with all of the test welds, that was uh, push as well. So that would have likely saw better penetration pulling. All interesting things. So I guess the takeaway is what did we learn today? Well, I learned that it does make a difference in direction that you push or pull. You should probably pull on thicker plates. I learned that stacking dimes, much as I suspected, creates a colder weld with less root fusion. And not only that, it really adds variables that I don't want in my welds. And I did all of this testing on quarter inch plate, which is very typical of all of motorsports in general. I mean, you go in an off-road catalog, a Summit Jegs, any of those, and you start looking at welds, it's really difficult to make stacks of dimes on real thin sheet metal, which is why you always see guys do it on 3 16 quarter and 3 8 plate, because it's so much easier. And I learned that, well, when you pull it, it's it's infinitely easier. Like, I could stack MIG, MIG like TIG all day, stack dimes with that pulling. It's far easier than pushing. But is it something that I'm going to do? Not really. I rather use a proper settings and pull, and even with a smaller weld, it still outperforms it. It has better penetration, and overall will produce stronger welds. On a uh, say a three pass weld where you have a root, and then two bead cap, I don't see the issue necessarily doing a stack of dimes uh, for a cap over a root, but you're giving up a lot if your root isn't fused. I mean, that's just the reality of it. Now, is what you're welding on a critical piece? Like, you're not going to find in heavy plates and stuff anyone stacking dimes unless they're using spray arc. And even then, a lot of times it's forbidden. And there's good reason behind that. And I think this video, what you learned today, probably shows why that is. You know, is this an end all be all? No. I mean, from my perspective, I don't really care what you guys do with your projects other than be smart about it. If you're building something that needs strength, you should be running stringers in straight in. Probably if it's thicker material, definitely use a pull angle. But if you're doing some barbecue smoker and you want it to look a certain way, hey, I'm not knocking that. I think that this you know, stack of dimes would work great on a smoker or something else that doesn't have any liability with it great you know aesthetically absolutely but for anything requiring performance no and i gotta tell you this guys the skill level that i'm at is beyond like a home hobbyist right if you're starting out you don't need to get in the habit of trying to make your welds look like this because remember guys i have at least enough experience to get some settings dialed in to where the crap works right you, if you don't have the experience and know what you're looking at, MIG is one of those processes that you could make a weld that looks like this, but it's even worse on fusion. And it, I guess I'll put it to you this way. If you don't have the skill to run a great stringer with proper penetration and all of that, don't be screwing around with stacking dimes. Like, it, it's not going to benefit you. And then on top of that, if you do get a job welding some, anything structural or code work, they're probably not going to like you doing this anyway, so you won't be able to do it either. So I think you get the picture on that. And I'm not, again, I'm not telling anyone what to do here. I'm not that kind of person. But I think I gave ample enough evidence and we saw the results of what you're dealing with. And we know that if you need strength and root fusion, don't do this. If it's aesthetic, okay, who cares, you know? So with that said, if, I'm sure there's going to be comments, questions, thoughts. I'll probably end up doing a part three. I don't know on what exactly, but if you have ideas on something you're still not clear on or et cetera, you can leave them in the comments and I'll probably include that in part three. So with that said, thanks for sticking around for the video. Until next time.